Hello, WP Campus. I'm here with Martin, and we're going to talk about our experiences with website governance today. But before we jump into that, let's first do some intros. So I'm John Richards, and I'm a developer advocate at Pantheon. There, I specialize in training teams on implementing website operation best practices. Now, before that, though, I spent seven years at Washington University in St. Louis in a myriad roles from developer analyst three to the senior director of digital communications. And while there, I had the pleasure of working with Martin. Um, before I started, I actually had only done just custom PHP development. And so Martin is actually the person who taught me WordPress. So thanks, Martin. You're welcome. Thanks for the compliment. Martin Yocum. I'm a senior senior web developer at Washington University in the marketing and communications department. And I help build the, the websites, the themes and plugins, as well as over the past few years, I've been working on custom HTML emails as well. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. Um, so let's jump into this. You want to go ahead and tell the people what the agenda is for today? Sure. The challenge was as a group, we were being hit with lots and lots of requests to make websites, but with very little insight on how we should prioritize the sites and whether we should do some of them or triage them and just put some off in general, <clears throat> which brings us to website governance. We needed a plan so we could get this accomplished. <clears throat> and there are three things we need to address in that in that process, coding, design, and content. And then lastly, we need to be able to communicate our policies out to the users. Thank you. Yeah, as he, Martin here talked about, we had that challenge. What were we going to do about it? Um, we were flooded with lots of requests. And at the time, everything just went into a solitary queue. First request we got, we worked on it. And when new ones came in, they went to the back of the line. And hopefully, we would get to them. And even the sites we were working on, sometimes it was like, why did we work on this? One of the sites um, I took on, um, I got I assigned a designer, and the two of us worked on building out this site for a department. We spent about four months working on this thing, building out the site, and it turned out pretty well. Um, unfortunately, within a year, they had decommissioned it and moved on to something else. We looked at the analytics, and only about a 1,000 people had ever even seen that site. So we had had two full-time employees working for four months to only build a site that was only seen by a th about a 1,000 people. It was very uh, disheartening. Um, and it was frustrating. Um, and I know I wasn't alone in frustrations. Martin, I know you ran into some challenges too. Yeah, we had a site for a campus store on campus. They wanted to have a, an e-commerce presence. And after our designer mocked up how they wanted it to look, I started working on the coding. And at the same time, trying to figure out how the e-commerce part would work. And we quickly realized that the campuses, the universities, payment system did not did not play well with the plugins we were trying to use at all. I I did manage to buy a beer glass through the website, but the whole process was not stable at all. It was not ready for production, and so the kind of ended up putting the whole thing on hold. And about a year later, we realized that someone else had actually built the site, an outside vendor, but it still had bugs itself. So we were stuck, we were spending our time, kind of spinning our wheels, working on these sites. In between this, we were trying to do maintenance for other sites, but with that queue ever growing, it felt like we would never get out and be able to work on the things that really matter. Uh, and this leads us to like, how do we find a better way? And that ended up for us being governance. Um, but when I first heard this idea of governance, I was a little confused. Maybe you are too. So let's start with talking a little bit about what governance is. Uh, so here's the definition we're going to be using today. And I also want to call out, we're going to be talking specifically about website governance. Uh, there's governance that covers a whole lot of things, tech governance, uh, governance in healthcare, governance in uh, lots of different places. But today we're talking about 
website governance. And we're even just talking about the governance that Martin and I worked on um, at Washington University. And the reason for that, we're gonna share some of what we experience and hopefully that helps you. Uh, but really governance often needs to be customized a bit to whichever locations enacting it. Uh, but there are some like best practices that are really able, kind of timeless that you could spread across any kind of website governance that you're gonna do. So the definition we've got here is pretty, um, you know, covers a broad thing, but it's about the human and technical systems, policies and procedures to manage website operations. Now, why do you even need that? So here's why governance matters, because uh, what you're looking for first is peace of mind. When you have a bunch of sites out there that you need to manage, um, you never know which one's having problems, what's going on, and it can get really overwhelming. And that's one way to get bogged down. And the other piece is that if you are managing sites individually, it's a lot to do. But if you can find ways to link them together, when we talk about governance, we'll talk about this, but you can find efficiencies of scale so that you can have a policy that makes it easier to roll this out. And so that increased productivity and peace of mind is what you're looking for whenever you're rolling out website governance. So whenever we decided about, so how did we enact governance. Um, this really came about through some new leadership changes at our department um, and the team began to work and like how do we get out of this problem um, and ended up finding a better way to do that. And what ended up landing on was an idea of centralized website governance. Um, and so by centralized, we had a specific team that got together. Um, they were called the PIT team or project intake team, and they would evaluate any website requests that came into our department. No longer was it, we built every website. Instead, we were trying to take a more thoughtful approach to how we handled this. And what happened is we ended up landing on three big buckets uh, that these sites could land in. I'll let Martin explain about how those broke down. Sure. First, there's the strategic sites. These are the ones that have high visibility and high impact for the university objectives. And these deserve the closest attention to details in terms of content and design and code, of course. They, uh, these include the flagship website that we have, wustle.edu, as well as some very high impact departments such as admissions or university advancement. Secondly, our, our second option was outsourced sites. So these are sites that have importance, but we really didn't have the capacity to, to get them done. And also for uh, departments who may have a little bit of extra cash, they could go outside to, to an outside vendor to get their site completed. And then lastly, we have the self-service sites, which is what we're gonna be spending most of our time today talking about. Thank you very much, absolutely. We're gonna be talking about specifically self-service uh, in the context of governance. There was governance around those strategic sites. Um, there was governance around managing vendors and things like that with the outsourced site. But our self-service environment ended up being over 2,000 websites. And so the uh, amount of sites and the complexity level there uh, ended up being large enough that it's the best example of how governance at scale kind of works that we have. Um, and so we'll talk about that specifically here today. And so when we think about these self-service sites, uh, there were kind of a couple criteria. We didn't start here. This was a journey, kind of evolved out to this, uh, but this ended up being the core things that we needed for this self-service environment. And of course, self-service uh, at the top of that list. And when we talk about this here, what we mean is we wanted for people Anybody at the university who had a university email address to be able to spin up on demand a WordPress site. Uh, so they could come in, enter their email address, and then create a, a WordPress site that they could immediately begin working on, publishing content on, things like that. Boom. So to make our lives easier, all of these sites have one theme among them to, <clears throat> one theme to rule them all, as the slide says, which is perfect. <clears throat> and that way, any code changes, any color or design changes that we needed to do for these sites, we could just implement once and it would be spread out through all of the sites instantaneously. Which is great for us at uh, trying to control that and have consistency and roll out this governance. But at the same time, we wanted to acknowledge uh, the users, our departments, the people at the universities need for uniqueness, uh, for flexibility. Like they wanted to craft something. And so the 
what we ended up landing on was a page builder of some kind. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about this later that has transitioned and uh, from old style page builders to now being Gutenberg, uh, but the ability to build something out that has flexibility um, and they can make something look like uh, unique for them. And of course, nothing would be possible in all of this plan if it weren't for the multi-press, multi-site capabilities. Absolutely. WordPress multi-site really lends itself to enforcing governance models because you can roll out uh, brand and, and coding things. Uh, Martin mentioned earlier across everything all at once really easily um, and still give some flexibility for the owners to be able to um, make their own customizations. And so uh, WordPress multi-site was the solution we landed it on for this. Uh, but uh, we also had a team there um, that needed to work on this, our kind of website operations team. And I'll let Martin talk about kind of the three-legged stool approach that we had. Sure, our, our team kind of falls into three basic groups, the coding, and what our basis is uh, we're both developers, so that's where we're going to be kind of content heavy in this talk. And we also have designers and content strategists to help round out all of the things you're going to need to build a website. And the, the goal of all of this is uh, twofold, which brings back our question of why. Yeah, so why, why were we doing this? Back to the this talk, but the whole point was we needed that peace of mind um, because we were stuck in these endless maintenance, loop, maintenance loops. Um, and then we also wanted to be more productive. How do we get out of that and begin to focus on what's important, what matters? Um, and so we'll, we're going to walk through these three different buckets and talk a little bit about some of the things we've discovered, uh, some of the important uh, techniques that helped us to be able to get a handle um, on, the, on what was going on and to be able to have the peace of mind to the first thing to look at, of course, from a developer's point of view, is performance. The, if the page doesn't load quickly, then you're going to have a problem. And we also quickly realized that you need to be cautious when you deploy the code, because if it uh, goes out to one site, it's going to go out to all of them. If there's a, a problem in the code, then everybody learns about it all at the same time. So you need to make sure that you're testing all of these and the code is optimized for link for working on all of your sites. Absolutely. I know I wrote, I made a change once to how we uh, added in like a feature that had a connection to the database. And it was something that would have worked fine on one website. But when we put this on, uh, rolled it out across hundreds of websites at the time, all of those sites trying to access the database in the same way suddenly caused the problem and sent uh, the whole system chugging slowly to a halt. Uh, we <laughs> thankfully quickly rolled it back, uh, but learned very important process of, hey, even if something's a good choice for just one site, it may not be the right choice when you think about doing this at scale uh, if you've got too many things doing it. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, another thing that's super important is understanding accessibility here. Um, you want to want your users to care about accessibility, and they're not going to do it if you don't care about it. Uh, and so there were a couple of different areas we focused on, Martin. I know you worked right. much on this. So we need to be able to make sure that the user can access the site and navigate through the site using uh, keyboard only or going through and listening through the site using a screen reader. Um, one common problem to deal with all this, at least from a developer's point of view, is making sure the menu systems work as an, as an example of what we work on. Yeah, I felt like I pulled out a lot of hair trying to work on menu systems. So uh, one nice thing though, if you do get it solved well, suddenly that's deployed out and solved well across all your sites. Um, another thing to be thinking about in accessibility is thinking about what standards you want to use. Um, back in the day when we were starting out, uh, we chose WCAG 2.0, uh, AA standard. Now I know 2.1 is out. Um, and so, but what I want to encourage you is to pick a standard, preferably the WCAG 2.1, uh, and, and begin working towards it. Um, you want to start somewhere. When we started our first theme that we were using was a custom built theme that we had bought and were trying to make work. And there was a lot of accessibility problems with it at the time. So we spent a lot of time trying to make that happen. Um, and it wasn't perfect, but it's really about working towards perfection. As long as you're getting better and improving, that's what's important. Um, we also then ran into some challenges around plugins that we didn't expect. Uh, we had to start reviewing these um, and we started looking at some key criteria when we looked at plugins because these became areas of issues. 
obviously performance is one. Um, we had to look at security. We'd look at um, the WordPress vulnerability database for plugins to look to see if there were security issues with it. Um, we would also look at the code. Let's see how it's coded. You know, th does this make sense? There might be something unoptimized in here that could cause a problem. Uh, we would look at activity. This was really important because we've had plugins that seemed really great but that were new, hadn't been used enough. And then uh, they were no longer maintained. And we were forced with either migrating everybody off that solution or take, picking up and beginning to support that ourselves. And so we learned like, hey, let's make sure this plugin looks like it will have a long life. Um, we also ran into some issues with duplication. Uh, there's no reason to have four different form plugins. Find one and you have a best use case for that that you use. Um, the other important spot here uh, around coding is around deployment. Uh, Martin, I know you've worked on deploying some of these quite a bit. So with a, a team of developers, and there's always going to be changes to be made, and what you don't want to do, we've learned, is to, get, when one of these changes is approved, just push it right up. We found it to be much easier and much less stressful if we set up a schedule system where we would come compile, collect all of the changes for a month and send them up to our test environments. And we could test those at scale on those sites. And then two weeks later, we would send all of those same updates to the, to the production sites. And that's how we would get things uh, excuse me, upgraded on a, on a regular scale, a regular schedule. Yeah, we'll talk more a little bit about that at, like the, when we get to communication, but that cadence is really nice for people to have common expectations on when new changes are gonna come out. Um, another thing we found as we were using that testing environment um, was it was important to um, test more than one site. Um, so we ended up having a set of what we kind of had like canary sites, like a canary in the coal mine um, that were like, hey, these cover a wide range of use cases, let's test those. Um, another important thing is when you launch any changes, just run through and check your top five or 10 most trafficked sites. Like, make sure they don't go down. And, and if they're all working, then probably the rest are. Um, because when you're working with hundreds or even thousands of sites, it's just not feasible to look and manage all of those unless you're able to roll in some automation, which is like a whole nother layer you can go into. And then also, it's, it's generally a good idea to locate your power users from all of your Canvas partners. And they can help you with testing because you may not have thought of a certain use case. And having more people testing your code is always better. Yeah, it's really great. Anytime there's a new feature, if you roll that out, everybody suddenly has it and like you can't pull that back now. But if you've got those power users like Martin's talking about, they can give you feedback and you can do some kind of uh, iteration early on with a, a small group um, and then later on roll that out more widely. So yeah, it's a really nice way to do that. So now I'm we'll talk a little bit about design and just, you know, our disclaimer here is uh, Martin already mentioned this, but we're both primarily developers. Uh, we worked with a lot of designers, but what we're going to be talking about is kind of design design from a uh, developer's perspective, uh, but we worked with them quite a bit. So hopefully this will be helpful in understanding how design plays a key role in the govern website governance. So the very first thing you need to remember is to make friends with your designers because if you're not, bad things happen. So one thing that makes it a lot easier using the one theme to rule them all is that you have much better control over the brand. You can control the fonts or the colors that you, that you want deployed and limit how much of a choice that the, that the users have. And also we decided as a group that we would like a designated space on all of our sites that would identify the university and also the, the university school and then also the, the department underneath the, the school and university as well. This added some nice consistency. So it allowed somebody, no matter where they were kind of landing in our ecosystem to get a better idea of where they were at and traverse back up if they needed to. And so having just that little bit of uh, screen real estate dedicated to being like, this is for the, the university level. You could build everything else down here. Ended up being really helpful in building that consistent experience across a lot of different departments. And of course, as with all aspects of the site, we need to talk about accessibility as well. I do have one example where it was determined our washi red color that we were using for hyperlinks was a little bit too close to the color of the normal text we were using around. And so we needed to make a 
a slight tweak to that specific color so it, it provided more of a contrast. And luckily, the way things are set up, one small change affected everybody right away. Yeah, it was so handy. We then had to do that across like our strategic sites we were talking about. And we had to have like a spreadsheet, like let's make sure we get this on every site and a checklist to make sure it got rolled out. But across the thousands of sites that were sitting in our um, multi-site environment, it just required that one deployment. And we knew all of them now were compliant uh, with our accessibility standards. So it was very um, handy having that level of efficiency um, to get those kind of changes rolled out. Um, another thing that came out when we first started, there were some really horrible website designs out there. People were just taking the builders that we had and just throwing them on the page and nesting them deep. I mean, there were lots of terrible things that we would share around, like, how do we fix this? Um, and thankfully, the designers um, realized that like the problem was that people didn't know what success looked like. This was very new, it was a new platform and people were just fiddling around like they were trying to figure this out um, using what they, the tools and stuff they, that they had at hand. Um, and what we really need to do was to be able to show them like, hey, this is what good looks like. What, what are you trying to work towards? And so um, they started out with some examples that were pretty modular, like, hey, here's the best way to do, you know, an events calendar layout or something like that. Um, and then scale that all the way up to highlighting sites that were built well so that people could look at those. And this really helped improve the quality of the sites as people began to see examples out there and be like, oh, I want my site to look like that. And would begin to copy those um, really helped improve uh, the look and feel. So then of course, the, the last but equal leg of this whole process comes content strategy. And again, make friends with your content strategies. One of the, the tasks that these people are involved in is trying to get a unified language style to help bind all of the, the websites into a, a united front, as you might say for the university. And one of the ways that you can test how successful your pages are is the Yoast plugin does include readability scores to tell you how, uh, for example, what the average reading level is on a certain page. You don't want it too high so that people get totally lost, and you don't want it too low to make it seem like it's a, it's a children's book or something. Yeah, those are handy. Uh, we also have uh, some writing style guidelines that um, were rolled out. Uh, one kind of a silly, silly example, but was actually very important to building um, consistency was that wash you when written that way should never have a space in between. Um, and so we have these different guidelines to make sure we are kind of speaking the same language. Uh, and so then when we got into accessibility, you know, we were recommending these content um, guidelines, but we didn't really enforce them because sometimes content comes from a central group that then spreads that out. But when we had hundreds and eventually thousands of websites, it was just too much for us to manage all that content. And so we had to empower the creators um, and give them the tools to do well. And so that included the guidelines, uh, but also we ended up looking at some tools to monitor this. So one that we had some success with was Site Improve. Um, we would use that to monitor our sites and we could even monitor for things like Wash You, make sure, does this show up with a space anywhere across our websites? And we can inform them, hey, would you be willing to change this? Um, or uh, more importantly, or maybe not more importantly, but also equally important is uh, things around accessibility. We wanted to make sure um, that we were helping them make right choices as they were doing their accessibility. And so people who were concerned about that, we were able to create monthly reports that said, hey, here's the accessibility level of your site. Um, are you adding alt text to your images and things like that to help them be better able? Are your, do your links say click here or not? <laughs> exactly. Don't do that. Yes, especially with uh, 2.1, that's now a big no-no, so don't do that. And then um, another piece in here around content is tracking. Um, and so thinking about how you're going to do this, um, you, and our, our department, the content team really leads up our analytics efforts. And so that data can really help you decide the direction you want to go. Uh, but it can be challenged to think about how you're going to implement it. And so there's a couple of different ways. We started out by having a global analytics account embedded right into our main theme. Um, and then we allowed individual sites to add their own. So you can have multiple analytics, but that allowed us to track data across everything while still allowing departments to have their own information. Uh, but this has gotten 
more complicated as things like Google Tag Managers rolled out, and then you have lots of other uh, tracking mechanisms that are that other groups have, like the Facebook tracking pixel. Um, and so you really want to stop and think about what kind of tracking you want to allow um, and, and how people are going to implement this. And in this case, um, it's really understanding like the, the level of your users and, and what they can do. Google Tag Manager gives a ton of power and can be really uh, empowering to your users. But the other side is, is do you want to support Google Tag Manager? Um, and so it you know, you're going to want to work this out and be like, are we, who owns this? How does this get handled? And so when you're thinking about governance, those are like important questions that you're going to have to work through and struggle with. Um, and it may, the solution may be different for each group. Um, just be thinking about that because at the end of the day, what is important is that you are tracking something so that you have the data to be able to show like, hey, here's why we could justify spending this much on hardware and all of this, because look at how many sites we're running, look at how many visits we're getting. Um, and uh, also for staffing needs and also to be able to understand how people are using your um, site so that you can continue to improve. And of course, after all of the policies have been set up on those three, three aspects, then we have communication. We need to be able to make sure that all of your users get to understand what we've just set up. So first level, uh, sorry, the first thing we want to mention is service level agreements, and we want to be able to post somewhere that you have shared expectations and people know what to expect or what not to expect with the self-service system. Absolutely. The first time we had an outage, we had no plan of what to do. And then we started getting all those messages coming in, like my site's down, what do I do, what do I do? And so we were able to mature that model over time uh, by having a group that we notify right away. And so they, they can respond to let people know. And then if sites are down for X amount of time, we send out an email and let people know what's going on and um, added some monitoring in there. And so just having those shared expectations like Martin mentioned are super important. Um, also some understanding of like, because this is a university-based website, what happens when you graduate or what happens whenever somebody who works at the university leaves? And so having a uh, elegant solution for how you're gonna do archiving and decommissioning of sites so that people can know and understand what that is, is really important. So um, this kind of a communication is really important. Uh, another thing that's important is educating people. Martin, I know um, <laughs> you've dealt with some of the training that's on the team. Yeah, we certainly try to. Um, we do have, well, at least recently we did, uh, one person dedicated to getting new WordPress users trained and how, how to actually operate the website, whether you're new to WordPress completely or you're still struggling with how the Gutenberg editor works. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have uh, training sessions for that. Uh, at one point they were in person, but now a lot of them are through Zoom, of course. Not surprised there. Kind of a surprise that came out of these trainings was that as people got together for these trainings they started to connect and talk to each other and then they would begin messaging with each other and be like hey look at what i built on my site and people would copy and what we had was these kind of informal user groups forming out of this we began to encourage it we ended up having a really great accessibility user group um would have speakers come in to speak on the topic um and and every month there was like a meeting around this. And so really just encouraging, like enable your users, like they're gonna decide how they wanna use this, how they wanna relate. And the more you can empower them, make them, um, you know, it's better. They were able to learn from each other, were able to grow. And it was kind of cool seeing that just organically begin to happen. Of course, things are gonna happen. Usually bad things, of course. <laughs> and it's important to be able to communicate with all of your users. That, uh, that things are going on and that you're aware of them and that there's a plan on how to get them resolved. Absolutely, change management, a big part of this, uh, both the unexpected, but also uh, changes and things that are just gonna happen. Um, figure out how to let people know, have people test, and give your users the peace of mind that you're wanting to have, because it really builds trust. The more you can communicate, the more they understand what's happening, the more they can trust that this system is working for their best interests. So hopefully these tips have been helpful. We're gonna do a quick recap here and kind of end with some takeaways. So takeaway number one for coding, be sure and plan well, because any changes you push live is gonna affect all of your websites. For design, expect the unexpected. People will try to use your, your graphics in ways you didn't anticipate, usually in cringeworthy experiments. 
for content, have a consistent language that goes, having a consistent language goes a long way in unifying your websites. And then also you need to be able to communicate your policies and what's going on with all of your users. Absolutely. And then here, maybe you're thinking about how do I start doing this? Maybe you're looking to jump into, hey, we need, we need an offering like this at our, our school. What can we do? And I want to encourage you to just do it. Jump in there. Um, when we started out, we had a much smaller vision. It was for 12 sites. And obviously, that got blown away as we got into the thousands. Um, we've had to go through three major and also painful migrations um, as we started with a custom page builder that needed to be redone. And eventually we moved away that. We did a page builder um, audit and we found a better one. And then Gutenberg was announced months later. And then they said, we're not going to support this anymore. And then we had to prepare for Gutenberg itself. And finally we migrated onto that. And even just recently with the rollout of uh, WordPress 5.8, um, there are changes that you are working on. Yeah. There are some small changes we need to get for most websites. And then also internet, sorry, IE11 rather, but of course we still try to support that, it is having some major issues as well. Yeah, and so I just wanna tell you, you know, as you hopefully have heard through here, we did a lot of things wrong, but we did do something. And we were able to begin iterating on that. And what is there today is a really awesome product that uh, we can be proud of. And so just jump out and do it. Know there will be pain points, but what you'll gain along the way is worth it. And it's really empowering. We were freed up to work on a lot of large strategic sites. A bunch of the team was able to begin working on those because of this. And so at the end of the day, we did achieve those goals that we were hoping for. Baby steps. Yes. Thank you all so much uh, for listening to our talk. Uh, hopefully this was informative. We'd love to hear back from you. So if you wanna reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn, we'll be happy to hear from you. Um, if you're here live at uh, watching live here at WP Campus, um, we'll be around for Q and A. So feel free to fire questions at us and we'll do our best to answer them. Thanks.